well, welcome everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, delighted to be uh, be joined on the call by uh, lots of friends from from Essex uh, universities and other places as well um, to hear from uh, Anthony. Um, it, it, weird in a way, I'm sort of introducing my boss here because uh, as a visiting prof at Essex, Anthony Anthony's my head of department, so um, I'm. Uh, uh, in that interesting position. I'll try not to muck it up for you. <laughs> but, um, a little bit of background from Anthony. I think you may have seen in his uh, his presentation some of the, the history, but it's a long and illustrious career. Um, it's currently the head of the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering at the University of Essex. Um, graduated with a BSc and a PhD. I think it was Lancaster you were telling me, um, Anthony, but early 80s, I think. is. Yeah. We won't go into more detail than that, but early 80s. Um, so PhD in physics, there's the, the physicist there. Um, but after his PhD, he started um, worked as a research uh, uh, associate on a project with BT, uh, between BT and Lancaster, studying on, and I'm going to pronounce these wrong, um, I think, Langmuir Bloggett films. Um, Bloggett. Bloggett, okay. I must admit, my, my physics has, has either never gone there or I've forgotten it. And I don't know which it would be. But um uh, looking at creating organic optoelectronics. Um, and I think the, uh, apart from that being, I'm sure, fascinating, it also st started a, what's now a 36 year relationship with BT. So I think be careful would be the message there, wouldn't it, for uh, uh, youngsters starting out in their career and uh, started to do collaboratives with BT. Uh, 1985, moved to Essex as a physics lecturer and um, became part of developing what's now I think the incredibly well established and I think certainly uh, on this 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 call we'd all say hugely successful relationship between BT uh, and Essex. Um, current research interests uh, terahertz technology and there'll be a ton of people on this call who are fascinated by that topic as well but in particular for the study of biological systems which is probably not one of the use cases we've been thinking of but um, fascinating and I think you can see the link right back there to 30 odd years ago and your uh, your uh, organic optoelectronics um, activity uh, and the other thing I think we'd say about uh, and I've learned this very much with the the things that um, uh, we've, we've seen Anthony do over the years uh, it is hugely enthusiastic about the process and the business and the science of education uh, and in particular I think it's fair to say enterprise and entrepreneurship uh, and engineering which is your your bucket um, your rubbish bin metaphor there it's uh, that that fusion of physics and entrepreneurship and engineering I think comes through in everything that Anthony's done uh, and in particular it created something called challenge degrees which are really designed to draw out creativity, imagination, and really make engineering appealing uh, to all, but also I think express its value to, to society. So uh, a real kindred spirit, I think, is what we have in uh, Professor Vickers. And I'm uh, delighted to uh, to be uh, have an opportunity to hear from him this morning. So over to you, Anthony. Well, thank you very much, Tim, uh, for that introduction. And uh, uh, I'm going to try my best to uh, take you through the, the 36 years. Of course, it's a short period of time, really, and there's, there's a lot more to do in life. I'm a young man still, but uh, I get the opportunity to take retirement, so um, other things are planned. But anyway, this uh, 30, uh, well, 36 years of change, actually, at the University of Essex, uh, I mean, I'm going to focus on physics, what was ESE and what is now CSEE, and that collaboration with BT. But I'll, I'll throw in some bits and pieces uh, as we go along. The, the first thing I would, uh, I would uh, put on the table is when I arrived at the university, so looking at the university uh, in this uh, relationship, when I arrived there in 85, that there was two and a half thousand students total. And the current figure is something hovering around 14, 15,000 with an aim, a pre-COVID aim, and I think still an aim, but with different strategies to get to 20,000. So it's a very different place, not so much a very different campus, because as many of you have been there, the, the kind of what hits you as the campus is the library tower and the squares. There are lots of buildings that have gone on around it, but still, as you walk down from the top car park, you pretty much see what, uh, what you used to see. Uh, <coughs> albeit with some little add-ons, um, but nonetheless, and it's been a great place to work and the collaboration with BT has been uh, has been fantastic. And my collaboration, as it started with research and has gone in and out of different things. I've been the head of department twice, 
uh, was head of ESE and now the head of CSE. And so that puts me in different roles meeting with Tim. But anyway, let me let me ramble through this. And uh, I will make reference to others' work, and some of those people are here on this call, so you can take great delight at the end in correcting me where I get things wrong, or or even in adding to it where you think it would would, would add value to this uh, ramble through history. So uh, I'm going to start with a, a photograph actually that I took in the Lake District uh, for for obvious reasons because uh, it's, it was a beautiful photograph. It was a beautiful day walking up in the Lake District with a lovely rainbow. And and uh, I don't think when I took it, I was thinking about uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, but it's a nice fitting uh, uh, gesture because essentially I've kind of fumbled through the electromagnetic spectrum um, whilst I've done my research. And of course, the electromagnetic spectrum is at the heart of BT and therefore the relationship between Essex and BT, the heart of that is essentially that that electromagnetic spectrum so let's just remind ourselves of, of of that so here it all is in different guises um you know size soccer fields out here water molecules out here protein bacteria virus we know a lot about those now and um you know you've got uh, that that scale you've got radio waves microwave infrared ultraviolet soft hard gamma the whole gambit of things and uh, I think it's just useful. I, I like these sorts of pictures because you say to yourself, yes, OK, that's 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 really at the heart of a lot of what we do. So that's just to kind of set the scene. I'm going to be uh, obviously talking about research that relates to this almost all the time. And in particular, I spend a little bit of time on the terrorist bit because it has become a bit of a passion. And it's, uh, I think, like uh, Mohammed, who was saying at the start that uh, he publishes a bit more now after retirement. I certainly intend to uh, to really get to grips with terror later on. Anyway, let's slide through these slides. Take us back to the 1980s. Um, as um, Tim said, I came from the University of Lancaster, where I'd spent seven glorious years, three as an undergraduate, three as doing a PhD, and one as a postdoc. Uh, and that was the link with uh, with BT. So uh, joined uh, and then shortly after that joined uh, the University of Essex as a new blood lecturer, as they called them in those days, uh, working with Brian Ridley. In fact, Brian had been on my interview panel at the University of Durham. I didn't get that job, but he nobbled me and said, why don't you come and apply for the University of Essex? Actually, I had to look for Colchester on the map, having come from born in Blackpool and stayed around Preston most of my life. I didn't actually know where Colchester was, but there you go. I do know where it is now. Um, so I joined that. Uh, and of course, um, even when I joined, the relationships between Essex and BT were, 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 were already fruitful. In fact, it's often said, and somebody later who was around er earlier on might be able to say, but I, I was told that ESE took a direction of telecoms because the post office had set up shop uh, in Ipswich at Marklesham, and therefore that was an obvious direction to go in. But uh, the, the, those those early days are a bit hazy, and certainly before my time. But others would would possibly uh, say more about that. Anyway, let's just uh, I'm going to slide through uh, some work. So this actually was uh, one of the papers that was published on um, based on the work that we were doing uh, around the project that then came into being the jo the JOAS project for those who are around Joint Opt Electronic Research Scheme project. Uh, and uh, the the aim those time really was to let's find out can we do nonlinear optics in organics? That was that was the aim. And there were lots of different uh, things around. We at Lancaster had uh, always been working on um, Langmuir Blodgett films. So Langmuir Blodgett films are films made up from um, molecule layer by molecule layer laid onto a substrate by dipping the substrate in and out of water and the molecule itself has to be what is called amphiphilic so it has a water loving end and a water hating end and so it tends to form a film uh, so it's a soap generically and it forms a forms a film on a, a surface and you can pressurize that with with a plate and then dip and, and make up and you can dip interestingly you can dip over a hundred layers, which is what you need to make um, an organic optical waveguide, 
So quite tedious. We did semi-automated, but remember this was the 80s, so things weren't all fully automated, but we, we had to go and we would make these films. And with the project with BT, we were trying to do um, optical waveguiding in them. And I would spend maybe a week making a film. We'd use prism coupling techniques to couple into the film and nothing. Uh, and I was explaining to Tim the other day, it was quite frustrating making them, taking a long time to make them, testing them, nothing happening. So in the end, I thought, you know, cling film is a thin <laughs> organic film. Let's see what happens. Stretch cling film on a, piece, on a slide, put a couple of prisms on, did the prism coupling, hey presto, light shot between the two prisms in one end out the other. And in fact, it turned into an undergraduate experiment with a bit of um, modulation on it so we could send um, um, sound from a, a, an output to a speaker um, and uh, it was great fun turned into a lovely but I never we never actually got those films to work however organic optoelectronics did push on in other areas and um, NPL had the first electroluminescence and the Cavendish lab actually uh, demonstrated and pushed forward on those um, light emitting organics the other end of it, well, maybe others could say more on it later, but the electronics, organic electronics, could be said to be still partly in its infancy now. But optoelectronics did take a direction. And of course, we've got OLED TVs now and um, various other things. But these early days were interesting and um, and challenging. And it was great for my first post PhD uh, position. Anyway. As I said, I moved to uh, Essex and that was actually to take a slightly different direction because Brian Ridley was uh, getting into at that point into low dimensional structures, as we called them then. Just had funding for a new clean room. BT represented to come along to the opening of the clean room. And I joined shortly after that. Uh, and uh, with my very first PhD student, uh, Andrew Straw, published this paper, High Frequency Current Oscillations in Gallium Arsenide, Aluminium Gallium Arsenide, Single Quantum Wells. So samples were grown at Sheffield and they were fabricated in our, uh, they were fabricated into devices in our clean room and we did work on them. It was great. It was absolutely fantastic. That, that clean room has subsequently disappeared, but we did get the university to fund a new clean room, which we have now, which is actually hardly been used yet because it was just about commissioned before the pandemic. But anyway, so that, that was the shift for me uh, into this semiconductor area and in the first stage, just looking at low dimensional structures, mainly from a physics point of view. OK, so meanwhile. Don Pierce and others developed the first telephone based system for deaf people involving cartoon extractions from TV images. And this led to significant interaction between the University of BT through EPSERC funding, for example, transmission of video and speech over high speed packet networks. So, uh, in fact, Don joined the university in 1969 uh, and formed the multimedia research group. Uh, in the presentation, I, I did find this audio clip of this presentation that he gave uh, in Canada in 1997 on the future of multimedia communications. <laughs> And in that, he gives some nice little anecdotes, and some of you may have may know this already. But Marconi, who also obviously came to Essex and, and, and close by, but Marconi established the first wireless school in 1901 in Frinton on Sea. And in fact, there's a plaque still on the building that can commemorates that fact. Um, then the multimedia research group had a long association with BT, starting with Dom, based on his pioneering work, followed on by Mohammed Gambari, who's on this call, and colleagues. Uh, and that led to more things in the 90s. So um, Brian Ridley was working with Mike Burt and Mike Adams from BT on impact ionization theory for use in APDs. And I remember uh, those days. And uh, Mike remembers regular meetings at BT, including lunch at the BT restaurant, always accompanied by Brian's favorite number six, which I'm pretty sure must have been a claret because Brian didn't drink much other than claret. Uh, and um, Mike O'Mahony uh, was working for BT at that point in time in our five submarine systems uh, and was later to uh, leave uh, BT and uh, join Essex. Stuart Walker joined Essex from BT in 1988, maintaining strong links with his BT colleagues. 
And uh, just as a little aside thing here, but it's relevant to networks, in 1983, Essex University allowed remote access to its DEC-10 via British Telecom's packet switching streams. We, could, we still called it British Telecom now, of course, BT now. Uh, and the packet switching network between 2 a.m. and 7 a.m. each night. MUD became popular with players around the world, and several magazines wrote articles on, on this new trend. That's a, a, a quote from uh, Wikipedia, I think. So actually, BT were there right at the start, providing a network for for what is now well one of the largest uh, uses, uh, certainly amongst young people, of uh, of um, network connections, and that is to to play games, multiplayer games. But there there it was, right at the start in the nineteen eighty three, the university giving access and um, allowing people to play between two and seven a.m. Fantastic. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. So one aspect of the cooperation between Stuart and his former colleagues was a free offer from BT to install a complete fibre optical network in our old building off square four. We don't we're not in that building anymore, um, but we were for many years. Um, and it should be noted that part of the department was over the student union bar. This being uh, very convenient and bears upon what follows. This is a tale from Stuart, so he can uh, tell you more about it later. So the installation technique involved using an air compressor to blow the bare fibre through the plastic tubing which had a closer resemblance of that used to deliver draft beer to a tap. So obviously um, through these buildings was uh, running the um, SU's um, beer taps, uh, but also the uh, plastic tubing for the fibre to be blown through. The installation was very successful, but was seen in some quarters as missed the opportunity to actually deliver beer from the student bar to every lab. But of course, that would be that would be frowned on today, even if it had been a remote possibility in those days. But anyway, and, uh, a nice little tale. Uh, but but you know, a real solid kind of position about the relationship between Essex and BT installing fibre networks right way back there. Um, and Stuart uh, running his magic as ever in persuading people to do things. Um, OK, so let's move on to the 90s. In the 90s, uh, again, uh, in the 90s, uh, we still had uh, the physics department. We still had ESE and uh, separately computer science. And there were there were involvements with computer science through people like Simon Lamington. Um, but let me say what was I doing at that time? So I pulled out from the papers from that decade this a proposed semiconductor laser pump probe source and this was a uh, work with uh, my PhD student a postdoc Rita Gupta that was in Essex at that time Philippe Muller who was a visiting student from uh, from uh, ENST Paris and uh, Didier Razmi who was also uh, from uh, um, EST Paris at that time, Paris Telecom, as they called it in those days. So when French Telecom actually had their own universities, uh, that's not the case now. So what was this about? So we realised uh, the gain switching, which was being studied by many groups, could be used as it was possible to determine a series of RF and DC components that would create the same shape, people set and pulse, but with a varying time delay. So we realised that uh, you could use this to basically have one train of pulses and another train which could move. So you've got a time delay. And of course, all the work we were doing was pump probe technique, and therefore this was uh, this was uh, fascinating to us. So that led to a gain switch semiconductor laser pump probe source. So um, and this uh, was published after we built the system. And this was based on DFB lasers supplied by BT. I think actually Ian Henning's group had some involvement in that. Um, and then oh, I've called it a BT spin out company, but I think Cambridge Optical Sciences, which was founded by Martin Lawrence, wasn't so much as a BT spin out, or as a spin out by Martin Lawrence, who had worked for BT. So I think it's probably a, a kind of uh, distinction there. It wasn't spun out, but, but maybe somebody else can, can tell me that later. But th that's what I believe. And he was building delay lines for BT from my memory and built this system for us, uh, which demonstrated it. And you can see uh, up here, you can see the actual instrument. I've still got it. It still works. So those DFB lasers that are in there, which were BT lasers, still work. And you can see here, uh, the plot of the DC and the RF, which give you this delay. So we were getting nearly 200 picoseconds of movement of the pulse, uh, one pulse train. And here you see just an scope of one pulse train and the other pulse train 
at a, at a, at a time delay between them. So this time, this pulse train would move backwards and forwards depending on this setting. So there you just, we, we had an algorithm uh, and um, we even um, had a patent on this, but uh, that patent uh, lapsed eventually and it didn't come into use. But I still think that it's possibly the only non, it's the only pump probe system that doesn't involve a, a mechanical system. But again, somebody might correct me on that. So, meanwhile, what was going on between uh, the University of BT in other areas? Well, Michael O'Mahony joined ESC at the University of Essex from BT, began the building of an impressive network group at one point. Uh, Mohamed Gambari continued the multimedia network research collaboration with BT using the LeanNet network, connecting the University of Essex with BT. Uh, in fact, and Stuart can say more about this later, that fibre has been rediscovered. And uh, I think it involved having a, 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 a patch that's broken in one place. But that dark fibre is now ready and uh, willing to take uh, new projects between uh, uh, Essex and uh, Ad Astral Park. Uh, it was part of a large network, uh, and, and I think Stuart tells me that many, much of that has been recommissioned for other things. But this one piece, maybe because it was broken, is, is there and ready to work. So Mohammed had started, just to go back to Mohammed, who's on this call, started as a postdoc working with Don and quickly rose to be a professor in many funding collaborative projects with BT involving Ian Henning. He joined Essex later in 2002, John Adams, David Hans, uh, many producing patents, both for Essex and for BT. And Mohammed's collaboration span ran about 20 years. So uh, just, you know, a, a very, a, this whole area of that multimedia lab started by Don Pearson, the long, long history of, of, of work with, um, with the department. Same time, Martin Reed and Rob Masaba were collaborating with Mike Hollier's team on speech quality assessment and 3D audio. Uh, so that work was, uh, was moving on and Martin Reed, uh, recently appointed as uh, a professor at the University of Essex after many years as a, a lecturer and senior lecturer. And, and Martin is still, as some of you on call will know, is still involved in the networks area and working uh, very feverishly on, on lots of different projects. And both ESC and physics ran separate workshops attended by both MSc students and company representatives, including staff from BT. So I remember the physics one. So we had the physics of laser communication as the master's program. And within that, there were four one week uh, workshops. And, and, uh, and as I said, they would be attended by the MSc students, but also people from industry. And there were things like medical applications of lasers, which we did with a whole series of doctor uh, couple tax with doctors There were welding uses of lasers with uh, with the welding institute and of course telecoms uh, with bt i don't remember i'm sure there were four and i can't remember the fourth one maybe somebody else will have a, a good memory of that but ese also had workshops and these ran and were another great way in which there was collaboration between the two organizations okay so initial major interaction with bt by mike O'Mahony after he came to uh, Essex was his involvement in a large European research project, MW2N, multi wavelength Transport Network, which was led from BT by Gough Hill and involved 10 major telecom partners, Ericsson, CNET, Pirelli, amongst others. Um, and um, the uh, project was to break new ground in the development of new telecommunication network architectures, employing optically routed transport layers. Project won the race uh, 1995 Technology Progress Award, and uh, here is the Hermes helmet, which uh, Mike uh, I still I, I, I assume he has in his possession because this photograph that you sent me looks like it sat on his uh, his side in the house. So uh, a wonderful thing to have uh, to have got. Okay, so just to slot this in back on the work that I was doing, so this was the patent um, that was on the pump probe system. I say I was very proud of it at the time. But it didn't make me any money. Ah, well, there you go. OK, so let's get to the noughties. Uh, so the noughties was re for, for me and for some others was uh, notable because we by the end of by 1999, the physics department did close, sadly, uh, a great, a great loss. But the change in the funding mechanisms for universities, those who remember this time, essentially made almost every physics department in the country bankrupt. 
um, by the, the funding model. To give you some feel, in those, from 85 to the late 90s, a physics department would feel very proud to have a staff student ratio of about seven to one. That was the working model for physics departments. And it worked really well, I have to say. But the new model under uh, a new government, which I won't mention, was that that ratio should be 20 to one. And therefore, immediately, all many physics departments across the country, including uh, Essex and UEA, became essentially uh, bankrupt and uh, eventually closed the doors, sadly. Some kept their heads above water, places like Durham and others who had numbers that were enough that they could keep going. But it was a big change in the funding model that really you know, knocked, knocked things badly. Fortunately, a whole group of people from Essex went to uh, York and a whole a group, including me, uh, moved from physics uh, into ESE. So it was rather easier for us. We just moved in the same building. Uh, and uh, within this period of time, uh, I became the head of ESE. Uh, and in fact, I was the last head of uh, ESE because also in this uh, period, um, CSE and uh, sorry, EE, ESE and, and computer science merged to form CSEE, which was quite scary at the time. But I have to say now, what a decision. It was, you know, what, where are we now? And I'll speak about that later. But anyway, let's look at the noughties. So um, I was still working in uh, semiconductors, optotronics, and uh, this is one, one, of, one of the papers I would pick out from that period, uh, the Essex Distributed Time Domain Model for Complex Laser Modeling. Um, I'd still, I'd argue this gets little light of day, but actually it was, it was, I believe it's still the only model that really um, doesn't assume a naive, naive um, distribution for the spontaneous uh, noise. It does it through a virtual field. So uh, this Stephen Higgins, who worked with me, was brilliant. I have to say, I can't, I can't say it. this was my idea. I guided him through, but Stephen was fantastic. And this was a really nice piece of work, which I was very proud of at the time. Uh, and um, obviously, laser modeling was, was really hotting up at that time. That was 2004. So now for something completely different, as uh, as we say in certain sectors of uh, British uh, society. Uh, so after developing electro-optic sampling in the 90s, using, for those who may remember, picosecond dijet lasers, anybody who worked on a picosecond dijet laser, a double dijet laser, needs a medal because they were absolutely excruciatingly difficult to keep aligned and keep working, um, but nonetheless great fun. So after doing that work, uh, and, and, and eventually it, the penny dropped to most people that if you try and put a high frequency electrical signal along a transmission line, coplane or whatever, it doesn't really like it. And therefore terahertz radiating pulses emerged and, and, and we branched into the field of terahertz spectroscopy. So I'm just going to, you will indulge me with just a little tutorial. I'm just going to spend a few slides just talking about this because I think it's apt now and i'll refer to it at the end because this idea of uh, terahertz spectroscopy is one of those things that keeps bumbling around but it's not quite getting there but i still have faith that it will get there so as we say in physics it's, it's all just balls and springs so if you want to start with uh, modeling um, and in this case i'm looking at um, biomolecules then essentially um, the it's hooke's law and the balls um, bounce backwards and forwards against springs. And of course, they get very complicated, but it is balls and springs at the heart of it. And uh, you get these sorts of things. Uh, I picked water because we're talking, we're going to be talking about biological side. And in fact, lots of people have actually focused on the water. Water is a fascinating thing. And in the presence of, of large biological molecules, of course, water is absolutely ever present. And uh, the water molecule will have its polarization adjusted by its proximity to a large biomolecule. Sometimes it will adhere to the biomolecule, but not for a long time. It will come off. Sometimes it will adhere and it will stay there for a long time. And all of that water around that biomolecule, which let's say on a site where another biomolecule will come and attach, that's real science. That's, that's gutsy stuff that to try and understand that. So here we have a large biomolecule shaking away there with a with a with a, with a particular mode, 
So you can see it gets complicated immediately. And this is one that we focused on, which is bovine rhodopsin. So this is a, a, um, uh, a G protein coupled receptor, which threads backwards and forwards through a cell wall. And it has, if you, for want of a better word, a glove on the outside for which something will attach. And on the inside, it changes something within the cell. So it's about communication. How do, how do you communicate across a cell wall when the chemistry outside the cell, the chemistry inside the cell are very different? Well, you do it through G protein couple receptors. And often they are a glove. Boom, something binds and that either activates or deactivates a process. And that's now, I can tell you, the whole basis, almost the entire basis of the modern drugs industry. Most developmental drugs are based on G protein couple receptors. Uh, so beta blockers are an example of that. In the case of bovine rhodopsin, the hint is in the first word bovine, this is from a cow's eye, and the receptor is actually something that will re receive a photon. So a photon hits the receptor on the outside and that changes the chemistry inside, which alters the flow of the ion channels, which leads actually to a current down the nerve ends, which tells the cow that it's seen something. That's what it does. But it's a great molecule to play with in this area because you can get it. You can get it. Uh, lots of cow's eyes, for what it better, are available because of the meat industry and the extraction of this um, is, is possible. And I was very grateful for people in our uh, biology department, now uh, the School of Life Sciences, who did that, that extraction. So that was Phil Reeves, who did the extraction for us and supplied the bovine rhodopsin so we could work on it. <coughs> so <clears throat> back to that electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, you've obviously got the different uh, waves in there. And uh, if you're if you're you if those of you are good, you can hunt and put the terahertz on there. I'll leave that as a little challenge for you as to where would you will put the 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 the, uh, the terahertz in that system. But it's just as a reminder. But essentially, there you go. All right. So the terahertz sits there, and uh, it's really fascinating because it's this edge between electronics and optics. And those of you who've done modeling, so in semiconductors, so you might use drift diffusion model. Well, drift diffusion model assumes that there is a drift and that doesn't really work at peak seconds or less. So how do you model when everything is happening on a femtosecond time scale? Well, you can go to um, other types of models, but it's still a fascinating area into how do you truly model. And in fact, um, people from UEA work with me on this right in the early days of trying to get some of this dynamics understood. Uh, but it's it's a fascinating area, still is. So we built a terahertz spectrometer. This is it. Uh, it was uh, sited at the University of Durham. I'm very grateful for their collaboration, for which still exists. And um, that instrument, uh, we also developed a silicon dove prism so we could do attenuated total reflection spectroscopy so that the sample would go in a well in here. This will be in the spectrometer, which was all purged with, nit with nitrogen gas, so no water vapor in it. And it had an easy access onto this surface for, to put the sample on. So they're all lovely engineering, all done by our engineering workshop at the University of Essex. The whole of that spectrometer, all this was built there. So you end up with getting a terahertz impulse and um, what you do in the business is you take that and you Fourier transform it. Uh, and then you say to yourself, well, what do I see? And what we were doing was looking at the difference signal between the unactivated and the activated bovine rhodopsin. And I think we demonstrated that you could see a difference. The question is, what does it mean? Well, th therein lies the question, because of course, in these large biomolecules, you have, it's not like far infrared spectroscopy, where you've got nice little lines there's thousands of modes and that is still the challenge for trying to understand the terahertz spectroscopy of, of biomolecules how do we start to understand what we're seeing and could that one day lead to the design of a drug so just note at the moment all of us that have been involved in semiconductors you can pretty much sit down and use software to design a resonant cavity enhanced photo detector you can have it grown you can fabricate it and pretty much do what you expected it to do maybe sometimes not but in principle 
that design chain fundamental to engineering is there if you want to design a drug you don't you have a big factory and you assay the hell out of it now we've learned to do that quick now but it's bloody expensive all right so because you don't really know what you're doing you know what sticks this sticks to that that seems to activate that seems to deactivate that seems to stop this virus working for example topical now but then you've got a lot of work to kind of isolate that and make it so that it's clinically acceptable and it can be in, in this case uh, taken by a human being so there's a huge amount of work that goes on this what needs to go on on this a lot of it computation a lot of it ai people starting now to say can i use ai to look at these complex spectrum that i get does it can it start to learn if i cycle through lots of different things so that's actually where i'm going to go and i'll more about that later because there's a lot of fascinating stuff to do there uh, so i'll come back to that with this chap here young ma who uh, was my phd student is now back in china uh, helping to develop a new terahertz institute in chongqing so that was a bit of an aside so you just give me that moment to say a little bit about that terahertz spectroscopy because it is fascinating and and uh, and it and it's it's lovely to work on so we're in the noughties, as we say, and you may remember the issue for dot com in the noughties uh, and it hit everybody. It student numbers, it hit uh, uh, um, activities such as the um, relationship between BT and Agilent and uh, the, the huge uh, tower block built on the west side of Ipswich. There was lots of things that, that got hit by this. Firm. So there was a wobble in the noughties and that wobble affected us all even universities however wobbles don't go on forever so studies in the optical networking area led to the formation of the uea the, the university of Essex spin-up company illatron and others may know more about this i remember it i remember all the talk about it uh, and it was the objective of building and demonstrating optical routes with the hope of commercial interest so the company involved in economics and students, key names, uh, Gough Hill, Dimitri Simeonadu, Tanya Politi, Anna Tazanaki, Dimitris Klondis, Ken Gill, Michael Mahoney. You might notice Dimitri there, who uh, took over from Mike at Essex and, and, and then uh, went westwards. We'll say no more. Uh, demonstrator was built and trialled at BT Martisham and, and at Essex using interconnecting networks. However, the early 2000s were not a good time, as I said earlier, and uh, Illatron did eventually sadly fail. Uh, and uh, but the technology and ideas are very much in use in, in, in today's networks. It's just one of those unfortunate times in history. And so the Illatron sadly did go into administration. So you need to tell it warts and all. We, you know, there are things, lessons to learn from that. But nonetheless, it could have been very different, but uh, it wasn't to be in this case. OK, so the two tens, that's interesting how you get all these, uh, you know, it's e it was easy when it was the 80s, 90s and it's the noughties and anyway, two tens. Recovery is all I would say in the two tens for us, period of growth for CSEE. So now we've got CSE formed, uh, really well established, student numbers rising uh, and not. So there, there was a rise in student numbers before the dot com and then a fall. And, and people say, well, that was it. That's not coming back. But people really didn't, I think, appreciate how much IT and this area were going to dominate the whole of society. So student numbers are now uh, did start to grow in the two tens and grant income rose uh, and a massive take, take up in impact led research through the funding opportunities such as KTP and an OBT are in that area as well. And um, just you know, the, the, can all, the, the two tents can only be said to be a period where um, things really started to hot up. From my point of view, I got into this terahertz more and more. And I, uh, uh, being, a, being a great fan of all creatures, great and small, couldn't just couldn't couldn't avoid this complexity, great and small analysis of biomolecules. And that's actually a reference to the fact that there's water there, which is really small, but highly complicated. And there's a biomolecule massive. And the interaction of the two is a challenge for the 21st century that's going to going to give us really interesting things. I'm absolutely convinced of that. So I was still chipping away at uh, the semiconductor stuff. 
So here's a paper from that uh, 2019. In fact, characterized this with 3,5 dilute nitride based multi quantum well pin photodiodes. So still chipping away at that a little bit here and there. Um, uh, but meanwhile, we're getting the, the, the plot now. Uh, after the early 2000s, research diverged to longer term optical networking technologies such as optical packet switching. This was supported by another major EU project involving UV and BT, BT exact technologies. Although a BT had a smaller role in this than in that earlier MWTN, but nonetheless an involvement. So now under the EU, the IST program, Project David looked towards a viable method of deploying optical packet switching in the network. This project involved 10 partners and was led by a technical unit of Denmark, Lars Dittman. And I don't know whether the call was part of this, is all things from, from Michael Mahoney. One of the things about EU projects is that they help support nationally funded projects and a major achievement was celebrated in 2004 with the demonstration of optical packet routing. Key people, Dimitris Semenidou, Tanya Politi, Anna Tazanke, Dimitris Konindis, Kengild, Reza Nejabati. And the demonstrators of a number of UK industries, including BT. So really still, you know, cutting edge, doing things that were that were really, uh, re you know, really useful to this uh, network. So these are all memories from Michael Honey. So another EU cost project with only travel funding, but turned out to be internationally influential involving BT uh, was COST 239 Ultra High Capacity Optical Transmission Networks, which proposed an optical network topology for interconnecting all the major all the main cities in Europe. This was used widely for many years as the basis for simulations of networking techniques. So again, still really at the core of, of really pushing out the, the boundaries on, on what to do with networks. On education, uh, Jim Mill, who uh, I know very well from uh, Innovation Marshroom based in Ad Astral Park, uh, started providing an annual lecture to final year undergraduates in 2013 to help them consider spin out options after graduation. I think Jim's probably on the call and I have a vague memory of the um, the, uh, the the prize on the seat trick. Maybe he can <laughs> remind us of that later, but it was a really good trick he had with the audience about uh, meeting customer satisfaction, a topic that I was talking to Tim about the other day. Uh, it's still very pertinent to everybody, whether it be a customer student for us or customer, you know, people on the end of a telephone for, for BT. So in 2017, Jim handed this over to staff at the new University Innovation Centre. And uh, we did start to do things with them, but clearly the last sort of seven, 16 months or so have, have, have sort of curtailed that. But we, we look forward to getting back into that. And I know Tim was telling me that that, um, that innovation and incubators and all that stuff is, is, is back on the, the topic list uh, for BT, as well as obviously for innovation marketable that sits on the same campus. So uh, just to pull Tim up here, so uh, in 2016, uh, I don't know what the role, your role is now, Tim, but then it was said you were the Managing Director of Research and Innovation at BT, and you, you were uh, created a visiting professor at the University of Edinburgh, and as you said, therefore I'm technically your line manager at the moment. Uh, and he joined uh, 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 Andrew Lord, who is also still a visiting uh, professor in the school. And just to add in, uh, when I did a LinkedIn search a little while ago, there were over 100 Essex alumni working in one place or another within BT. So it's it's a relationship that's strong, not only in all these things I've talked about, but but in the way in which um, the uh, we supplied students to BT as well as BT supplied us with staff. Uh, so I can't go without uh, some of the, the the later things. I work with BT wins Global Telecom Award. Uh, Hanny here and the team at BT really pushing out the boundaries here. Uh, a great achievement there for the. Um, Global Telecoms Business Innovation Award. Fantastic work. Uh, so the 220s. Off to a challenging start, I think it can be said. Um, but uh, we're going to need engineers and scientists more than ever. You know, how are we going to live in this pan, this post pandemic world? What are the changes? What needs to happen? There are the very fact that we're all used to using things like Teams and Zoom. Uh, what's going to happen? How will that have impact on what we're doing? Not least of which the challenge to actually sort out um, this this um, this this ability to defeat these viruses. So it's going to be challenging, but it's going to be a ride. So I uh, just pulled this from the university website. 
so quickly university established people that could give expert opinion on COVID. And I'm very, very pleased to say that um, within diagnosis and treatment, uh, Vito Di Fio and Javier here are two members of uh, the CSE team who are helping to build what had pre-pandemic been our dream of having a health group. I've just got word that we're, we're going to get funding to add some uh, clinicians from SNEFT into this uh, mix. And we really see uh, health robotics within that, AI within that as a massive area. I know that that also overlaps with thinking at BT. So I'm sure there's going to be some really interesting opportunities there. So where next? Well, uh, some of those of you will know we've just submitted our REF. And with that, we've aligned uh, to four big research groups, AI, brain computer interface, and neural engineering, uh, communications and networks, and robotics and embedded systems. So four research groups with now nearly 75 academic staff. And that doesn't include the four or five posts that I've already been told we're going to get uh, uh, within the next 12 months. So we're going to be pushing 80 academic staff. When I took over as head of department, we were 40 something. So it's been four years of a blast of, uh, of appointments. I think I've been on an interview panel almost, it feels like almost every day. But we're really in a, we're really in a great position now. Four key research areas. Um, and uh, we're going to have input there. In the area of networks, every citizen wants best internet access, of course. But also, they want to feel safe. There's a, there's a sense of not being safe online at the moment. What are we going to do to make the ordinary person feel safe online, not worry about an SMS message that tells them that they owe money to the post office? How are we going to crack all this? this is, the, the, I'd say if there's one thing I've tried to maintain all the way through my career, it's, it's people. It's people that count. We have to think of it as an individual. So don't collectively think people think, here's somebody, my mother, 87, trying to use her smartphone that I just gave her and not wanting to feel threatened by it. That's really important. So I'd, I'd put that as a marker for all of us. What about BT? Well, fibre to the home, 26 million homes by December 2026. I think that's uh, what Tim gave me. 5G rollout, of course. More spin outs and incubators. Back to some basic and applied research. And what? And, and of course, there's always an and, it's always dynamic. When I listened to the audio uh, of Don Pearson talking about the future of networks in 1996, he does actually say, you can't do this. You really can't do this. But then he does a little bit, but you can't. You've always got to be watchful. You've always got to be alert. You've always got to be willing to, uh, to move forward. So what about me? And I'm conscious of time. I'm probably gobbling up the rest. And I'm, uh, there was pings, which were probably time to shut up. So me, well... If you buy a wooden boat that's the same age as you, so this was built in 1959, then uh, the answer is clear what you're going to do at some of the time in, uh, in retirement. And I am going to really enjoy this, which I've restored back to operational condition. She's lovely, one bamboo, and uh, I'm going to have some lovely time with that. However, I will return to lab-based research, uh, joining my former PhD student, Ma Yong, at a new terrorist institute in Chongqing when the pandemic allows. Uh, and I'll, mit I'll maintain my role as a higher education education consultant. And I've already got things lined up in, in Sweden, Estonia and Mauritius, obviously well chosen places. So uh, I'm not going away. I'm just changing what I do and, and getting that monthly paycheck without actually going into work, which sounds really appealing. But I'll stop there uh, and apologies for going on. Uh, and um, I'll uh, give it back to um, the hosts. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. Olivia. That was uh, fantastic and a lovely, uh, a lovely meander down um, down memory lane. And many, many, many uh, friends name checked on en route. And um, I mean, what a what a successful crew. I mean, if you think about where, as you say, many of those people are who you've you've helped on their way in their careers. Um, some real leading lights of. Uh, of of the field we're all in, so uh, it was lovely to uh, lovely to see those things. Um, I don't know whether we've got any specific questions. You you were rattling my my memory in terms of those courses. There was a um, certainly a Wibnow House. I, I used to do, give a lecture on fiber amplifiers um, at, on on a course that was run, but I can't remember which department it was run by. Whether it was physics or or engineering, I just can't recall. Paul Urquhart used to be uh, uh, involved from the BT side. 
Ah, yeah. I think yeah, well, that probably was ESE. Probably. It probably was, wasn't it? it? Probably was. But um, but yeah, br brilliant and some some really interesting stuff and some brilliant physics as well. You certainly um, uh, stimulated my my interests in some fields I'd not not uh, previously been interested in. But uh, I see Carol's got a, a hand up. Carol, do you want to ask a question or say something? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Hi, Anthony. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating to, to hear that that story and, you know, all of the, the many different things and many different people that you've worked with. My question is about, I know you're very passionate about making engineering something that appeals to a wider kind of audience and wider range of people. And I just wonder if you could reflect on the changes you might have seen, particularly in terms of, in terms of kind of male-female diversity across your career and, and what you think sort of still needs to be done to improve that. Just a nice, easy question to start you off. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's fine. I mean, I, I, as, as Tim uh, mentioned, and I didn't really draw on it, I, I could have done, one of the things I did as, as head this second time, and it, it really was a, a reflection on the things that I tried to do over time, is to, to try and get students to focus on the idea of their own personal creativity and imagination. And, f and if, if at school we did that, people might understand that actually engineering and science is about creativity and imagination. And I remember going to a launch of the, of the creative arts at, uh, at a, an arts institute in London. And I stood up and said, you know, does somebody actually not think that engineering and science is creative? And there's this sense that engineering and science is about numbers and uh, art is about creative and imagination. It's nonsense. They both have tool sets. The tool sets are different. But what you do with those tool sets, I mean, through lockdown, I've been slowly uh, learning how to play the mandolin. Nobody else would want to listen to it at the moment, especially in my singing, but I'm learning the tool. But the creativity and imagination, I don't know. Um, look at the boat. I think he's still on the picture. That's called One Bamboo. Those of you who are my young players will know that One Bamboo is uh, the unusual tile in the Mar Young set because it's not a bamboo stick. It's a bird it's the lucky tile so i've got to thinking to myself i'll write a novel about this boat and you know wax lyrically over it. so creative and imagination is everywhere and we we've, we've got to in schools and you know your your bt you've got a massive kind of audience how do you get people to just come along and understand that it's creative and imagination first and foremost and there's a tool set to be learned but that tool set shouldn't be scary uh, just on, on the other aspect of that, or just, bef just before this pandemic, there were things going around where, where I remember there was somebody hired by the government and he was going to go to schools and say, stop allowing it to be acceptable to say, I'm no good at maths. So, and he was using it as an analogy. Imagine saying to somebody, I can't read or write. That would be totally unacceptable in society. But in our society, it's completely acceptable to say, I'm rubbish at maths. Stop it. You know, and so cure that, allow kids to be creative and imaginative with science. And, you know, look at all these things happening around us, massive explosion of space and its use. Fan you know, fantastic opportunities. But so what I do in the degrees now, we have these challenge weeks. We have these things where they stop and they say, here's a problem. What of all the skills I've learned? How am I going to put them together? Now you will get students to say, what do you want me to do? I, I, you know, I, if I ask you to paint a painting, I don't tell you what to do. So use your creative and imagination. So we've got to get that angle right. Girls, still a topic, and, I, and it's absolutely societal. I've been to universities, you know, in, in India and Sri Lanka. There are 50-50, even in, 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 in Thailand, 50-50 girls, in, particularly in ICT classes. There's no cultural barrier to doing those subjects. But we still have a massive cultural problem with, with doing those things for women. And we need to keep chipping away at that. We've got women in CSE now, great team, really working hard to try and do that. But it's a big shift in society to cure that one. But clearly, science and engineering will be so much better if it used the other half of the population. We need to do that. And we all should work really hard to do that. Sorry, a bit of a ramble answer, but... I tried to give you the passion there that I just think it's about making that first point. This is creative. It's not about numbers and it is underneath the hood, but that's just a tool. Thank you. That's perfect, Anthony. And uh, say so the passion shines through in all of it. And, uh, you know, here, here to uh, to all those points. And I think the 
Well, I think we see that, you know, with the, you know, the number of folk we host at a Astral Park, it is about trying to get across that sense that this is exciting and creative, but also important. You know, that actually, if you're if you're motivated by changing the world and making it better, then these are brilliant subjects to uh, to study, you know, engineering, physics, science. Um, you know, they're not they're not just a, a personal indulgence. They are actually the route to to uh, having a positive impact in the world. So, uh, you know, spot, spot on. Um, just sort of seeing if there's any other questions, if there isn't one. You, you mentioned um, a little spin out on optical routing. I mean, optical routing is something that we're we're starting to look at again. I mean, is that I'm sort of half tempted to say, you know, send, send us the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's because uh, it is one of those things. That's, it's we've never quite landed it, have we? But I mean, you know, yeah, Andy but I'm sure Stuart uh, could probably uh, Stuart. Yeah, maybe we'll pick that up with you, Stuart, and uh, yeah. have a chat about that because that is something that uh, I know Andrew Andrew Lord is uh, is starting to look at again. You know, wondering is is now the time when? Uh, oh well, thank you for that, Tim. Yes, um, Andrew and I are in regular communication. I I really welcome your comments. So you'll be hearing from me about that. <laughs> thank you very much. Very good. I've given you the open. Give me the uh, the end. And I always enjoy being a conduit. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. So, what, one any final questions? If uh, if not, we're at the we're at, we're at the eleven o'clock point. No, oh, I can't. Yeah, indeed. I can't see any. In which case, I will uh, just thank you once again, Anthony, for a um, fantastic presentation and uh, a, a really I mean a tour de force. I mean it's a. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised, should we? Be right because because uh, having done your bio and done the uh, you know little little outline of your career why would we expect anything else but it was beautifully presented and uh, and very entertaining and I think the uh, but also just very thought-provoking you know so I think we probably leaves it me to, to to wish you well um, on that lovely looking boat uh, but also we you know we're excited to let's see the pictures of the lab because I imagine what, what the way you describe it it's going to be a pretty cool lab with some with some pretty cool stuff in that allow you to in, indulge all that uh, that imagination and creativity and uh, sort of get back to the tools as uh, as it were so uh, good luck with that and we look forward back on to, the bench yeah we look forward to uh, to seeing the results and hearing all about it but uh, i know you're gonna we're delighted obviously you're gonna continue the role at essex so we've got um uh you know continue continuation there and lots of lots of friends to for, to for another 36 years of a great relationship with Essex. Absolutely. But, uh, Absolutely. Th thanks ever so much for the time this morning. And um, and uh, thanks also for not doing my annual performance review uh, live here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. All right. And uh, thank you all of you for joining. And uh, it was great to see some of those faces. The people who are blast from the past, do get in contact. You know, let me know what you're doing. That would be great. Very good. Right. Thank you very much, Anthony. All the best to you. OK. Bye-bye. I shall leave now. Cheers, then. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye-bye.